Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. On this program, we track the global news media, examine dominant narratives, and spend more time critiquing journalism than celebrating it. We're not an award show. But to mark the end of 2019, we wanted to examine a few cases where quality reporting, the kind that speaks truth to power, exposes wrongdoing, and helps rectify it, has made an impact. Picking just four examples was not easy. We wanted to get across geographies, different kinds of stories, various forms of media. We settled on West Africa and a documentary exposing sexual harassment on university campuses. Hong Kong, first-person videos capturing police brutality on the front lines of the protests there. Brazil, a tale of corruption at the heart of the Bolsonaro government, as well as the United States, investigative journalism on the sex trafficking of children that has had international ramifications. Journalists take a lot of heat. Some of them deserve it. We'll be back on their case next week. But for now, four examples of the Fourth Estate making news for the right reasons. It's been viewed by more than two and a half million people and been trending its way to the top of Twitter feeds in both Nigeria and Ghana. Africa Eye has been watching. Sex for Grades is a film produced by Africa Eye, the investigative arm of BBC Africa. It follows a radio presenter and investigative journalist Kiki Mordi as she exposes sexual harassment in West African universities. Morty says that she herself was a victim of that harassment. She and a team of undercover reporters posing as students inside the universities of Lagos and Ghana clandestinely captured teachers abusing their authority, demanding sex from female students in exchange for better grades. The film has its critics who say the undercover methods used were unjournalistic. We put that to the BBC, which argued that if there is no other way to expose the story, secret recording must be done. As for the film's impact, all four lecturers incriminated have been suspended, despite their denials of misconduct. A sexual harassment bill has been reintroduced by the Nigerian Senate, and a whole lot of West African University students feel safer on campus. You might find some of the following scenes disturbing, but good journalism sometimes has that effect. Deal with it. I came across this story when I met a member of the Africa Eye team who had explained to me that they've received a number of messages from people asking that the issue of sexual harassment in Nigerian universities be investigated. I'm not sure at what point we came to the decision that I would tell my personal story it's something that everyone already knew that I was invested in emotionally and professionally. A lecturer began to target me. For two semesters, he withheld my exam results and pretended I never sat the papers. When I asked him to explain why, he repeatedly demanded to have sex with me. And I wasn't, I wasn't going to do that. And as a result, Right? My results suffered. I never got a degree. I never graduated. The harassment forced me to drop out of university. We had a, a small team of journalists in Nigeria, in Ghana, and in the UK. And we were all working simultaneously together. We had a lot of obstacles we had to overcome. Uh, but some of the hardest would include I'm having to depend or rely on a person who's scared for testimonies. Uh, because we had a number of times where people would just run away or their parents would ask us not to contact them again. Several current and former students claim they had been abused or harassed by Dr. Boniface. Two of them agreed to speak to us on camera on the condition we hide their faces and their voices. He always seemed really friendly. He comes to you and tells you he's a pastor, so you don't even see the danger in him. All right, you'd hear testimonies from 30 different women saying exactly the same thing, and these women don't know each other. And what's worse, we go into that room and that exact script is played out all over, like in front of you. 
it was equal parts scary, shocking, and just tiring. It's just tiring. Like, how has this script been playing out for this long and no one has done anything about it? I knew deep down that this was a pattern. I think it was more shocking to experience a pattern being played out. I won't let you hang. Okay, sir. It's okay, sir. Okay, sir. You know, people like to make excuses for abusers and people like to make ex excuses for harassers. But right there, visualizing it, seeing it, and putting your own daughter in that room, I think you would have a rethink about the excuses you were going to make for abusers or lecturers who harass their students. So it was really important that we put that part in the film. Since the release of uh, Sex for Greats, all four lecturers that were featured in the film have been indefinitely suspended and there have been calls from various factions asking for um, you know, an investigation into these schools. About 15 universities somehow found themselves being enrolled in the Sex for Grades movement and um, it resulted in about 25 d dismissals or suspensions. Uh, that just tells us that perhaps maybe we are ready to do something about this culture of sex for grades. There was a time he told me, and when he's done with me, he's going to give me to one other lecturer in my department to do what he likes with me. And then, when he's done, to transfer me to someone else. And there is nothing I can do about it because I won't graduate. People are finding healing in their own way. Uh, myself, I personally am finding healing in my own way. Uh, people are reaching out and people are just communing. There is a sense of community. A lot of people have feared for my safety because I did, I named about four lecturers in this documentary and I still live here in Lagos and I still work here in Lagos. I am a Nigerian. Uh, this is my country, I'm not running anywhere. Here. He invited me to his office three times for tutorials. He was consistently inappropriate with me. At one point, he leaned in really close to me. I could see from his eye line, he was, you know, looking right here, like leering at my breasts. This was not a film to cuddle the emotions of the feelings of anyone. This was seen university life through the lens of a young Nigerian, you know, undergraduate. And if we can't even stomach five minutes of the discomfort that she feels in real life almost every day, do we then understand how bad the problem is? What began nine months ago as a spontaneous demonstration against a proposed extradition bill between Hong Kong and mainland China has evolved into the largest protest movement Hong Kong has ever seen. Covering it can be dangerous work. Media workers have come under attack repeatedly by both uniformed police and plain-clothed security personnel. Some reporters have been caught in the crossfire, but they've also been targeted despite wearing some of the tools of the trade, those helmets and vests with press spelled out on them in all caps. With Hong Kong's once independent print sector now in retreat, the job of chronicling this story has fallen on a new generation of digital journalists, reporters like YP Lam from Stand News. Stand has led the way with innovative coverage of the protests, often live streaming them, capturing the police violence, putting it out there unedited, well before the police and the politicians have a chance to spin the story. I think the most important thing is to be able to do it. But in the end, we have to do it. 幾不同的在現場報導的一種方法
跟進住個現場嘅狀況。對於讀者嚟講咧，其實係。誒、呃、一種幾新嘅體驗，佢哋可以跟住，好似可以跟住個記者嘅視覺，親身經歷咗嗰個示威現場。即係如果用呢個字啊，我哋係針對警方嘅。咁原因就好簡單嘅啫，就是、因為其實即公權力嘅運用就係我哋其實主要要去做嘅一樣嘢，同埋因為佢哋係即合法地可以使用致命武力嘅部隊嚟咁所以佢哋係應該要被針對嘅。喺度，立立開嚟開啊！傳媒嘅功能係要確保公權力喺去執行嗰個法例嘅時候個過程係合宜、合適同埋合法噶嘛。咁所以即係警方似乎到而家咧，越嚟越唔去正視，佢哋就即係 keep 住覺得。記者咧就係喺度搞佢哋嘅，甚至係即係故意搞事啊，幫啲佢哋口中嘅暴徒啊，甚至係曱甴等等。咁所以咧就好似即係將記者都當係個示威嘅一部分，同埋係敵人嘅一部分咯。全部入燈，全部入燈，全部入燈。現場前線嗰度有啲咩困難呢？即係其中一個最主要嘅來源一定係來自於警方噶啦。由初初即係佢可能會鬧你啊，之後就趕你啊，到到揾電筒照你鏡頭啊。近日咧就開始去到咧，就即係已經係用誒胡椒噴霧噴你啊。咁亦都有好多行家，甚至我啲同事咧係中過彈嘅，即係當然唔係實彈啦，譬如催淚彈啊、橡膠子彈啊，即係大家都中過曬噶啦。到到再近日咧係會即係直接拉記者，例如我本人啦，我就俾人即係定即係稱呼咗做用愛去暴徒。然之後我自己都試。試過喺誒衝突現場嗰度咧，就俾警方用呢一個水炮車嘅嗰啲顏色水咧，就噴到成身都係嘅。咁但係佢係故意架車噴過幾次，調整個角度，確保一定射得中我哋嗰個位，然之後先開炮。咁另外仲有就亦都試過喺誒去影警方喺誒拘捕行動嘅時候，咁咧就有一。其他嚟增援嘅警察咧，就係、是、完全冇理過我係做緊乜嘢咧，行埋嚟咧就攞支警棍咧就即係叉我條頸啊，同埋不停咁推將我推後咗十幾米咁。然之後個過程入面咧就嘗試去撳我鏡頭啊、扭我隻手啊等等。坊間就傳緊啲風聲咧，就話其實政府係考慮緊推出一個官方認證記者嘅方法，即係去分邊啲係佢認為係記者嘅人，邊啲唔係。咁你見到其實佢哋都幾明顯咧，係想將嗰個傳媒嘅自由空間咧越收越窄㗎啦。咁喺呢個大風向之下，其實未來即係喺香港做記者只會越嚟越難嘅啫。我唔知你有冇燈喎，行開啲嘢。有咩啊？警察封鎖線，行開。有咩燈？我唔知你有冇燈。唔止係我哋公司，我諗所有嘅傳媒啦，又或者係誒、嗯、香港嘅市民都會好明白，我哋身處緊喺一個呢、這個城市嘅歷史嘅一個好特別嘅時間點啊！一國兩制啦，誒、嗯、基本法啦，以至到未來香港嘅。前途同今次呢一系列嘅示威抗爭，以至到之後官方嘅處理手法，係會好影響到未來呢個城市嘅走向。咁作為一個傳媒，其實我哋責無旁貸，必須要係去將啲信息帶俾我哋嘅讀者。而誒、嗯，其實讀者嘅反應亦都話到俾我哋知，即係我哋咁樣做係有佢價值同埋必要嘅。Brazil now and a journalistic investigation of a legal investigation. Both have had a major impact on politics there. Lava Jato or Operation Car Wash was the biggest anti-corruption investigation in Brazil's history. It started five years ago and landed hundreds of politicians and business figures in jail, resulted in the fall of one president and the imprisonment of a former president, Lula da Silva. The judge who led that investigation, Sergio Moro, was later appointed Minister of Justice by President Jair Bolsonaro. This past June, the online news outlet The Intercept Brazil published a series of exposés, largely based on leaked phone text messages. They called it Vaza Jato, a play on Lava Jato. It exposed corruption at the core of the anti-corruption investigation and implicated Sergio Moro, the judge turned justice minister himself.
secret Brazil archive is a trove of previously undisclosed material, messages exchanged between Sergio Moro and senior car wash prosecutors, exposing how the fix was in, that the target of that investigation was not just corruption, it was the most popular politician in the country, Lula da Silva. Nós recebemos as informações uh, que originaram a série de reportagens Vaza Jato, que falam da força-tarefa da Operação Lava Jato no Brasil, de uma fonte anônima. Precisamos responder sempre a duas perguntas, se o material é autêntico e se o material tem interesse público. Nós uh, imediatamente identificamos o óbvio interesse público na divulgação desse material, porque o material mostrava muitas impropriedades, muitas ilegalidades, muito, muita, muita ação antiética dos procuradores da Lava Jato e do ex-juiz Sérgio Moro. Então a gente decidiu publicar esse material por ele ser autêntico e, obviamente, por ele ter interesse público. Nós juntamos a nossa equipe para contar para todo mundo que nós teríamos um material bastante importante, bastante complexo para ser trabalhado, mas inicialmente nós não contamos para todos os membros da equipe do que se tratava esse material, justamente para proteger o sigilo da fonte, proteger o sigilo do próprio material e evitar qualquer tipo de especulação e vazamento por se tratar de um material bastante sensível. Posteriormente, nós começamos a conversar com os parceiros e fomos adicionando repórteres e editores de outras redações de outros jornais, é, rádios e sites do Brasil e também do exterior e de vários espectros ideológicos também. Infelizmente, uma outra parte da imprensa, liderada pela Rede Globo de Televisão, que é a rede mais importante do país, uma das redes mais importantes do mundo, que tem muita audiência e muita força no país, preferiu discutir o que eles chamaram de crime, de obtenção das conversas, no aplicativo Telegram, ou seja, passaram semanas gastando tinta para imprimir jornal, revista, gastando horas de televisão e rádio para falar sobre supostos hackers, sobre como a, as informações foram obtidas e para especular sobre as fontes do Intercept. Na semana passada, o ministro da Justiça, Sérgio Moro, denunciou ter sido vítima de um crime. O celular dele foi invadido por meio do aplicativo de mensagens Telegram. Nós começamos a sofrer muito ataque digital, principalmente nas redes sociais. Os nossos jornalistas começaram a ser bastante atacados, fomos alvos de fake news, muita montagem de notícia falsa, declarações absurdas. E também o nosso site foi alvo de ataques cibernéticos, tentaram derrubar o site por várias vezes. O Glenn Greenwell, como cofundador do, do site, ele é a figura mais proeminente do Intercept. Então, durante a, a, a publicação das reportagens, por exemplo, o presidente da República fez uma ameaça explícita, pública, é, diante de microfones, de expulsão né, do Glenn Greenwell do Brasil, ele como, como americano. E o Glenn também acabou sendo é, objeto de comentários caluniosos, o mais importante deles, promovido por um jornalista bolsonarista de extrema direita, apoiador do Jair Bolsonaro, chamado Augusto Nunes. Ele é um comentarista de uma rádio chamada Jovem Pan, uma rádio que tem muito alcance no Brasil, muita audiência. O Augusto Nunes disse que o, o, as forças de ordem do Brasil deveriam investigar se o Glenn e seu marido estavam cuidando muito bem dos seus filhos, que são os filhos deles são adotados, né? eles adotaram dois filhos aqui no Brasil. O Glenn, num programa de rádio ao vivo, diante do Augusto Nunes, ele questionou o Augusto Nunes em relação a essa fala. Como o Augusto Nunes não repetiu essa fala e, na verdade, falou que tinha sido um comentário irônico, o que é, obviamente, uma mentira, porque não existe ironia nenhuma no seu comentário, o Augusto Nunes perdeu a cabeça e desferiu um tapa no rosto do Glenn ao vivo nesse programa, nessa rádio Jovem Pan. Você é um covarde, Augusto Nunes. Você é um covarde. Que isso? Parou, parou. Que isso? É isso aí. O impacto mais óbvio e público e, e, e que se tornou uma notícia global em relação a publicação das reportagens da série Vaza Jato foi a soltura do ex-presidente Lula. Mas essa não é, esse não é o único impacto da Vaza Jato e talvez ele não termine por aqui. Algumas leis devem mudar, alguns entendimentos de leis devem mudar, alguns entendimentos da Constituição brasileira devem mudar e isso vai beneficiar a população brasileira porque a Constituição brasileira ela vinha sendo muito desrespeitada por conta da pressão popular, da pressão das ruas em cima de políticos, em cima de operadores da lei e em cima de ministros do Supremo Tribunal Federal.
Our last example of impact journalism is a deep investigative dive into the Jeffrey Epstein story, the American financier who sexually trafficked and abused underage girls. It was published by the Miami Herald as a three-part interactive web series produced by a team led by Julie K. Brown. With the support of Aminda Marquez Gonzalez, among others, Brown uncovered the real story behind a legal case brought against Epstein in 2007. How a millionaire with friends in high places like Wall Street and Buckingham Palace got a sweetheart deal from the Florida courts, pleading guilty to serious sexual crimes against children and getting just 13 months in prison. By speaking with key players in the original investigation and digging through years of court and FBI documents, the Herald exposed how the American justice system failed Epstein's young victims, allowed him back onto the streets, and put so many other girls at risk. The Herald called its series Perversion of Justice. When Julie Brown first approached me about doing the story, Quite frankly, my, my question to her was, what are we going to tell that's new? What are we going to be able to say that no one else has covered? And her response was, no one has heard from the victims. Nobody's heard the victims' stories. I can't have my breasts touched. It brings back things. I tried to breastfeed for the first time, my third child, uh, last year. And it was the most excruciating and heartbreaking thing to not be able to do it because the pain was so intense and it brought back something that felt so stupid back then that felt, I thought had no relevance and that if I told anybody, they'd be like, you're a whore, you wanted money, why would you do that? Julie was able to identify for the first time, uh, 80 potential victims of um, Epstein. So she was able to get um, you know, more than a half a dozen of those to actually come on camera. I was 16. I was 16. I started going to him when I was like 14, 15. Then there was the issue of really gaining the trust of the key players in this case, not just the victims, but also by some of the key law enforcement officers. There was a point in the investigation where Julie Brown came into my office and she said, I have a key law enforcement you know, source who doesn't want to talk to us because he says we're going to be cowered into not publishing the story as other publications have had, um, have been. And I said, absolutely not. We have never back down from an investigation and we're not going to do it now. They were recruited by someone who was adept at finding girls that would be willing to you know, go to a house for a few hundred dollars and as it started out, you know, give a man a back rub, but many cases it turned into something uh, far worse than that. Uh, we started this investigation long before the Me Too movement actually made news. The timing of the case, the new information we were able to bring forward, um, the piecing together of how this deal had come together, all of it I think had an impact that was far beyond our expectation. And I will say that we were assisted from uh, some excellent investigative journalism. When the indictment was announced in New York, um, they credited um, some investigative reporting um, for help with the case, and that was really um, very, uh, you know, that was very rewarding for, for us. The Epstein investigation is a perfect example of a story that was really um, a South Florida story that became national and has had repercussions not just here in the United States, but abroad. But you were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. If there's one thing that the Jeffrey Epstein investigation, I think, embodies, it is the power and importance of local and regional news organizations. And so 
in this time of you know truthiness and and fake news i think that the emphasis is regional on the ground local reporting is making a difference in every community not just ours but across america and readers we need you to support it because that is really a hallmark of our democracy it's no accident that we ended that piece on a call to action, a cry for help, the financial kind. Fake news is cheap to produce. You just make it up. But investigative reporting, particularly at the regional level, is time-consuming, resource-demanding, and expensive. The organizations producing it, whether they work in West Africa, Hong Kong, Brazil, or the U.S., are needed now more than ever. You've been watching a special edition of our program on journalism that has made an impact. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post.